Welcome to the third part of chapter six. And here's where we're going to talk about the Roman Empire or Imperial Rome. And here's a nice text slide. So Octavian assumed power in 27 BCE and was conferred the title Augustus, which literally means awesome. Um, an over life-size statue of his likeness was discovered in Prima Porta that portrays him in the prime of his youth and may commemorate, commemorate apotheosis, the transforming into a god. Uh, the detail is naturalistic enough to be recognizable as Augustus, but his portraiture was known to double as political propaganda. It's the picture I just showed you. So here he is. Not quite as well illuminated as the earlier one, but I, I have more to show you. So this is um, Augustus Prima Porta. <clears throat> and um, there's a lot of controversy about this. Not only was it propaganda, but it was... I've heard people argue that this was created when he was actually a very old man and it shows him sort of in the prime of his life. Uh, the possibility of it being his apotheosis has a lot to do with his appearing sort of uh, superhuman, not, not aging the way humans do. And there's also more. So look at what's holding on to his uh, tunic down there. Uh, that's a little baby. It's not, isn't that weird? So <laughs> it's not just the little baby. This baby has an identity which helps us see Caesar Augustus as a semi-god or a demi-god. This little baby is actually Cupid. So I told you the foundation story of Aeneas and how Aeneas was a semi-god or a demigod because he was the son of Aphrodite slash Venus. And so that's the, one of the legendary foundation stories of Rome. So here, um, the Caesar Augustus is claiming connection to Aeneas because Cupid, shown here, the little baby, also known as Amor or Love in Rome, Cupid was also a child of Venus. So he's saying that he's descended from the offspring of this god or goddess um, by having Cupid show up here, hanging on to him. And he's barefoot, and like I say, he's looking kind of superhuman anyway. So let's zoom in on him. I want to point out that his hair and his facial characteristics are very um, authentic. They resonate with all the other portraiture of him. This is a period hairstyle, this short Roman hairstyle and beardless appearance. So um, the, what is also of interest is his cuirass, this piece of armor that he's wearing on his chest. <clears throat> Um, I'm finding the details of this. Oh, I see I don't have the details of this. Well, um, it was, it was, uh, this commemorates a, a battle where the Romans had their royal, their Roman standard returned to them from a barbarian troop who was over in the Near East. And so it's sort of something he's bragging about here. Here he's claiming credit for it. So it's not incidental. These are no, just not figures to fill up a space, but they have actual resonance with historical events. Uh, yeah, you don't need to, I guess, really know that. Um, and here are two more portraits of Caesar Augustus. So during the period of his predecessor, who was Julius Caesar, the Roman Empire had spread tremendously. I'll show you a map in a little bit. And it covered most of the known world. Oh, I think all of the land around the Mediterranean, including Egypt. And here is Augustus appearing as a pharaoh, wearing the headdress and the kilt He's missing his beard. There may have been a beard attached and now lost. And on the right, he is shown as the Pontifex Maximus, or the high priest of Rome, draped in his toga. 
and the toga is draped over his head, which would, which symbolizes his uh, role as a priest. And of course, the prima porta in the middle. So uh, Caesar Augustus, it was important. So the age of Augustus, the Arapacus Augusti commemorated Augustus's triumphal return to Rome after establishing rule in Gaul. Gaul is present day France. It unites the portrait and allegory, but unlike the Parthenon frieze, it, it records of actual individuals as a specific event. So let's look at this. Here now is the map of the Roman Empire I told you I would show you. So it's huge. Um, you have to remember that just a few centuries earlier, there was just a little tribe here on the Tiber, and they were neighbors of Etruscans and Greeks, and now they've, they've gotten really, really big. Um, and they have a lot, a lot of reasons for that, but they don't have very much to do with artwork, so we're not going to really discuss them. But there you go. So it was possible. This is all really treated as one large country. And if you were a Roman citizen, you could travel more or less freely within this country and nobody would challenge you and you would not meet hostile armies. It was all uh, peace. It ends up here at Hadrian's Wall, just south of Scotland. And Ireland, I need to point out, uh, was never Roman, never part of the Roman Empire. Neither was Scandinavia, Denmark, a large chunk of Germany. So there are areas that escaped Roman occupation. So let's move on. <clears throat> this is the city of Rome. And I will show you this again, I believe, in the next unit, the next chapter. So this is a map of Rome in the Republican era. Here's the Tiber River over here. It could stand to be a little bit bluer, so it would stand out. There were two phases of walling in the city, and uh, Rome just expanded so rapidly that a second wall had to be built. So this is the inner wall, and then the outer wall is the one you see here. Um, over here, all of these things are racetracks. I'll talk about these next chapter. But the Arapacus Augusti was placed on the Campus Martius, which is just across the river over here. So there's the mausoleum of Augustus, and the Arapacus was very close to this, to this mausoleum. I don't know why it's not on that map. <clears throat> but it was uh, within the city walls. And here's the Arapacus. It was designed after an altar, an altar where people would bring offerings to the gods and bring them up here and place them on an altar where they would be burned. It's decorated with relief friezes on the inside and the outside. The outside one has figures on the upper register and vine scrolls and decorations on the lower. The inner uh, frieze is garlands and trophies of um, cow skulls, things like that. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat. I just have a very phlegmy throat. And this is um, a detail of the upper register on the outer frieze. And this shows actual portraits of people in Augustus's family and his extended family. I find it really interesting because it gives us a lot of detail and it shows a lot of future emperors, these children, for example, every figure here has been identified and named, and their portraits resonate with other known portraits. So that's how people are able to identify that. So for those of you who are really into uh, Roman history, from the left to right is Marcus Agrippa, the child Gaius Caesar, Livia and her son, Tiberius, who will be the next emperor, Antonia, who's Augustus's niece, Drusus, Livia's other son, and Antonia's husband, and the child Germanicus, the children Gnaeus and Domitia. So there you go. <clears throat> so let's talk about the Roman home. So now we're going to sort of leave the political... Um, history behind and talk about how the everyday people lived. 
So most Romans lived in multi-story apartment buildings called insulae. The city of Pompeii was preserved when Mount Vesuvius buried it under 20 feet of volcanic ash in 29 CE. Homes there had a centralized impluvium for collecting rainwater. They did not have the aqueducts at Pompeii. Uh, the House of the Vedii contains a peristyle courtyard with a garden. So uh, Pompeii was a little coastal village. I think I have a map somewhere. Uh, here <clears throat> are some of the frozen figures from Pompeii. And I, I think this is real interesting. Pompeii was not discovered until the 18th century. And we'll, so we'll talk about Pompeii at the time that it was headline news. But um, when it was, and archaeologists were digging through the, the ruins, and, you know, it's earth by this time, and they're digging down into the earth, and they're finding buildings and sculpture and stuff. But they would also come across air pockets, and one of the archaeologists had an idea, and he took some liquid plaster and poured it into one of the air pockets, and then... After the plaster set, they removed all the earth around it, and he uncovered these frozen figures of the people who had been trapped in the ashes of, of Mount Vesuvius. So it's really haunting. There are several of these around. Now, on the lower right is a map of the area showing where Pompeii was and where Mount Vesuvius is. So here's Pompeii, and the mountain is there, Naples is up here, and this big gray area is everything that was covered with the ash. So you can see uh, Naples escaped. This is the, the Gulf or the Bay of Naples. And um, several cities, not just Pompeii, but Stabiae and Pompeii and Oplantis, Nucteria, and Herculaneum all um, were covered, all effect, were affected. Up above now, this is a picture of the city of Pompeii, which had walls around it like most cities did and um, a few years ago this beige area was all that had been uncovered I mean this is really recently and may this map may even be just from two years ago I'm not real sure the date of it and the green area indicates the area that has not yet been dug up so Pompeii even though you think it's pretty small and it should have been completely excavated by now. It has not. It has not been. So uh, there's plenty more there to see. <clears throat> so let's take a look. So here's one of the houses, the House of the Vedii. And like that text slide said, the, the volcano exploded very suddenly and it, it just stopped life. People tried to run out of the city, but they they didn't have enough time, so they were trapped sometimes in the act of running um, and sometimes not even that. There was everything frozen like a great time capsule. So if somebody was in the act of preparing dinner and they had food and dishes or pots and pans out on the counter, those would have been frozen just like that for the archaeologists to come and discover. So this is huge. Um, other cultures have not given us this glimpse yet. We've seen tombs. We've seen these prepared virtual afterlife spaces. But we haven't seen the actual everyday space of real everyday people. Uh, so we're just going to look at one Roman house. And uh, it, yes, this one was in Pompeii, but it also reflects the style of houses that would have been in other cities as well. So uh, this is a house, and there's a street here, and there's one entrance, the door there. It looks like there's another door over here, so there could have been a shop front here. You never know. Um, I can't tell you specifically. Here's the impluvium, the pool that would have collected rainwater. And then from there, you go out into this garden. I'll show you a picture of that. So this is open to the sky, the garden. Um, so fresh air and sunshine come down into the house through this atrium. And uh, the sunlight goes into these rooms from here. So there's no windows in some of these. And these are dining rooms. 
and uh, Ixion room. I'll show you paintings from there. <clears throat> so it, it's self-contained. There's no front yard. There's no backyard in this particular house, but the yard is enclosed within the house. So here's the yard. Here's the garden at the, um, the house of the Vetii. And it has been restored. This would not have been just an ornamental garden, but it would have been a functional space where people would hang out laundry and they would do outdoor work, messy work. Um, and they would enjoy the garden and maybe have a fountain here. So uh, gardens were very common in Roman homes. And here's a doorway on one of the houses in Pompeii. Uh, so you can see the scale. It's kind of crazy big, crazy tall. Why it would need to be that tall, I don't know. Um, but there it is. And by the way, right across the street here, this photograph was taken in 2002. And right across the street was a completely unexcavated area. There was just a wall there and then fill. So the volcanic fill behind it. Here's a very unusual but very nice back garden that was on a house in Pompeii where this man had built this long water uh, channel that was a fountain. And uh, I think he, they thought he had grape arbor, arbors growing over it as well so he could make his own wine. <clears throat> Here are the streets of Pompeii. So um, these represent the fronts of houses. Obviously, they're in ruinous state now, but a few things you can see. And one is that the street has is low and it has a sidewalk which is raised. And that's because uh, Pompeii did not have a cloaca maxima. And so people would dump out their waste into the street. So it served as a street, a thoroughfare, and a sewer. But if you were just walking, you would want to walk up here on the sidewalk so your feet didn't get filthy. And if you had to cross the street, they had these raised crossing stones so you could get from one side to the other without getting into the muck. <clears throat> it's my daughter, by the way, modeling how to cross the street in Pompeii. So Pompeian homes had decoration on the inside. Uh, so we can assume the Romans lived like that. They had painted walls with uh, figures on the walls lots of times. And they had mosaic floors because um, that was pretty and it was functional. These floors were like little pieces of tile or stone that had been fit into a ground. So they made a real solid stone-like floor that was decorative and it could be washed and kept clean. The alternative would just be plain stone or uh, dirt and dirt of course would be dirty. So this is desirable. This is one of my favorite floors. It's called the unswept floor and it looks like uh, somebody imagined what a floor beneath a really messy dinner party would have looked like afterwards with shells and peelings and uh, some unidentifiable pieces and a little mouse down here looking to see if there's anything edible. <laughs> so the unswept floor, very cool. Another floor, and this is the second time I've shown it to you. Uh, no, third time, sorry. Yeah, we get to look at this mosaic a lot. And this is the Battle of Alexander and Darius III at the Battle of Issos. And this is where it was found. It was placed in a house in Pompeii. So the Pompeians love their floors. Um, also, something I never discussed before, we talked about the portraits, but the thing that I find really remarkable here is that the artist has tried to give us a sense of reality, um, showing us the chaos of battle where it's not lined up, there's no order, it looks very messy, and just to accentuate that has included the rear end of a horse, because uh, any time else we saw parades of horses or horses figured on anything. They were always in nice, neat profile, all lined up in orderly, and this one is quite different. So here's two more mosaic floors from Pompeii. I like these also, and uh, they would have been right inside the front door in that entry hall 
where you would greet your visitors. And the, you can see the words under this dog, right? The dog, look at him. He's so ferocious. He's got teeth, but no worries. He's chained up. And the word says, Cave Canem, which means beware the dog. <laughs> Here's another one in another house, um, also showing teeth and chaining. I don't see the words on this one, but the, the meaning is clear. If you have a dog uh, with teeth on a chain greeting you at the door, it's pretty obvious that you have to be careful. So the House of the Vedii contains some of the best preserved wall paintings of the time. The Ixion Room pictures resembling framed panel paintings and swags of garlands are painted above the marble dado. Three dimensionality is enhanced by use of linear perspective and volumetric figures. You're going to see painting now is getting really exceptional. And this comes from the Romans who really like their portraiture to look real. So um, these are some of the paintings from the Ixion room. So the Roman painting is, is quite varied. There are several different styles. There are different uh, periods, different trends. One of them is like this where a panel looks like a flat wall with just a simple little design like a trophy on it. Another is to paint a panel that looks like a fake window where you might look out and see buildings nearby, other buildings or openings, gives you the illusion of windows opening onto a view. And then um, this most sophisticated looks like a scene, like a painting, like a panel painting, um, illustrating figures in a story, historic. Yeah, and these have all been identified. This is Hercules over here. Uh, so... And look at the way the figure's been modeled. I mean, we have not seen this kind of painting before. It's gorgeous stuff. And there's, uh, there's linear perspective in this. There's all kinds of illusionism. The Romans are very good at painting. So speaking of painting, one of the houses in Pompeii is renowned for its um, very unusual room. It's called the Villa of Mysteries because of this room. So there, uh, there are murals that completely go around the entire room and uh, they seem to be illustrating the initiation ceremony of the cult of Bacchus. Bacchus is the Roman equivalent of Dionysus, the god of wine. And it was a very popular cult in Roman culture. There were several cults that were um, that existed, that were participated in, that were not part of the official state religion. They were like secret mystery cults. People had to be invited to join them. But there seemed to be a lot of them. And my theory is because uh, the people wanted a lot more from their belief system than the state religion gave them. The state religion just really wanted you to bring offerings to the temples and be gone with you, um, the, but the people had a hunger for more, so um, there were lots of cults. I'm going to show you another cult presently, but this is um, uh, the Bacchus mystery cult here dating from about 50 BCE in the Villa of Mysteries. So four walls contain one continuous scene, presumably the initiation rite. Like I said, I'll show you the entire thing. Um, so you can see how odd it is. I should also say that the cult of Bacchus was mostly popular with women. I, it may have completely excluded men. I think that that is uh, highly probable. Whatever was written down in history about it was written by men who would not have known, and they speculated, so they wrote down what they thought was going on. Uh, but this probably was uh, instigated by somebody who knew what was going on. So uh, we see people doing weird things, like this woman's carrying a tray of food. That's not weird. Um, this little naked child is reading something here. Um, and then you get figures like this Selenus here, this drunken figure who often appears with the wine god. He's like one of his companions. There's a whole um, group of 
drunk people that hang around with Bacchus or Dionysus. And then here, more figures with some goats. Is this woman dancing with a scarf? Quite possibly. Um, and here, another, uh, it's, it looks like a pan figure to me because he's got these odd little ears. The boy behind him is holding a mask up over his head. Um, I believe he's holding up a, a container of wine and letting this boy drink. And here we have the wine god himself. So this is his staff that is, sorry, I forgot the name of it, that has uh, is blooming with grapes on it. <clears throat> and um, yeah, he's drunk. They're all drunk. They're all just drinking lots of wine. Here's where some of the weird stuff is. So here's a winged figure. She could be um, related to a Etruscan deity or some other. She could be a victory. And she seems to be holding a whip. This woman's also bearing her back. She could be being whipped. Um, this woman more most likely is being whipped. This is the woman who we just saw with the wings whipping her. And she's also got her back bared. And this woman seems to be dancing in the nude with a pair of like finger symbols. She's clapping over her head. And um, this figure has a little Cupid type uh, puto who's ho maybe holding up a mirror to this woman who is combing her hair. So you can see why the archaeologists who found that called it the, the Villa of Mysteries because they hadn't a clue what it was all about. <clears throat> <clears throat> so now we're going to look at some royal, some Roman imperial art and architecture. And the one that's most famous, the one that you know about, is the Colosseum, also known as the Flavian Amphitheater. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, I keep having to clear my throat. It's really bad. Um, I think it's allergies. <laughs> so. Um, it was called the Flavian Amphitheater at the time it was built because the Flavian dynasty was uh, the, the, were the people who built it. It was built to house spectators for animal hunts, performances, and fights to the death. It's made entirely of travertine, it's a type of marble, and tufa blocks, and concrete faced with stone. Concrete is in bold. Pay attention to that. The attic story on top is wall-like and curving. Every arch is framed by engaged columns. So there we go. Here's what there is left of it. This is the Colosseum in Rome. Now you can see the arches, the arcades that encircle this, and barrel vaults and groin vaults. The whole thing is like a, a honeycomb of arches and, and arcades and vaulting. It's just... It's, it's incredible how many arches are in this place. <clears throat> so you also notice that it's kind of got something missing here. And this is because in the Middle Ages, the, the Catholic Church, who was building lots and lots of churches and buildings all over Rome, used the, the old Roman area, the Roman Forum, as a stone quarry because the Romans had cut and finished all these stones and built their pagan temples out of them. So the Christians just used them and recycled them into churches. So um, they were doing that to the Colosseum when somebody stopped them and said, no, 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 stop doing that. So they, they uh, left it half destroyed. So also want to point out, I think this is probably our clearest view of the exterior, is that the three Greek orders all appear here. The Doric is on the bottom, the Ionic next, and the Corinthian on top. And that's because this is the heaviest, the next lightest, and the lightest yet. So it sort of makes sense structurally to have your lightest stuff on top. Um, I'll show you some reconstructions of this. So uh, there's the view again, and here's the interior of it. So um, you can see in this photograph that there are long passageways that are, would have been under a floor. 
And these passageways were used for the performers and the fighters and the animals to move around to get in position to come out and perform. Now I'll show you here. Um, this is what we just saw. You saw the passageways under the floor. So this reconstruction of the uh, Flavian Amphitheater shows you how it would have looked. An amphitheater means two theaters, so it is really two half circles joined together. And uh, it looks and it functions a lot like a modern day Colosseum where people could enter and they would climb upstairs underneath the seating and then they would get to as high as they wanted. They would come out of an entrance and walk along this little ledge and find their seat and sit down. I've been in stadiums like that and you probably have too. Um, this thing floating up above was a huge canvas awning that was made to stretch out and give shade on really, really hot days in Rome. So that's what these poles around the top, they would have supported the canvas awning and give it some shade. So the floor here was a wooden floor and it was covered with sand. The name arena is actually Latin for sand. So uh, the sand of the Flavian Amphitheater is where we get the word for arena. You are learning all sorts of interesting things today. Um, but it was mostly covered with sand, and this is where the gladiators, gladiators would fight. The wild animals would come out and fight. On occasion, they could flood this, which I just find mind-boggling. I don't know how you could fill this with water that wouldn't just leak out like a sieve, but I'm, I suppose they patched up all of the seams with pitch or tar or something. Anyway, they would flood it and have these little funky little ships and have uh, mock sea battles in there. So it couldn't have been terribly deep. And here's an imaginary view from a romantic artist. I believe this is a 19th century artist um, showing what the gladiator and his crowds would have looked like inside of the Flavian Amphitheater. So there's also a link here. If you were having a live class at this point, I would, uh, I would show you the clip from the movie Gladiator which was from the year 2000, I want to say. And uh, it shows the entry of this group of gladiators, including Russell Crowe, the, the main character, into the Flavian Amphitheater in Rome. So be sure to watch that. There's a link now on Canvas, so you can, you can still enjoy that. And if you have not seen the movie, the Gladiator. I really recommend it. I think it's very good. It has a lot of really good set design and you get the sense of what ancient Rome would have looked like. So, Gladiator. Here's uh, the source of the name, the common name today of Colosseum. So this is uh, a piece of artwork that no longer exists, so we don't know exactly what it looked like, but it was a huge statue of the Emperor Nero. Nero was a Flavian, so he was uh, part of this, the family that brought you the Flavian Amphitheater. But uh, the statue was colossal, and because the Colosseum was next to the colossal statue, this was called Colosseum. Um, so I got that nickname. This is the end of part three, so stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed the Coliseum part, and I do hope you will watch that Gladiator clip.